Hello, everyone, and warm welcome to today's podcast. Hope you all are staying safe. Today is Friday, November 17, 2020. I'm Rifat Manan in Philadelphia, and I'm remotely joined by my good friend, Emilio Madrigal, who is in Boston. Today, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Yuna Kang, who is an assistant professor of pathology at UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine in California. She is going to deliver the eighth lecture in the ZYN Pathology Lecture Series. And the title of the talk today is Inflammatory Vulvar Pathology for Surgical Pathologists. As always, please feel free to post your questions and comments on both YouTube and Facebook chat windows. And we will pass them over to Dr. Kang at the end of the session. And thank you, Dr. Kang, for joining us today. Over to you now. All right, thank you, Dr. Manan, for the introduction and thanks to Pathcast for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, are you able to see my slide? Yes, okay. Dr. Kang. Great, I'll move on. Uh, the title of my talk again, as um, Dr. Manan introduced, is Inflammatory Vulvar Pathology for Surgical Pathologists. As a faculty in both DermPath and GynePath services at UCLA, I have become familiar with types of vulvar biopsies that we deal with on both services and the challenges that come with it. So I am happy to discuss some of the things that I've learned about inflammatory vulvar pathology with you today. Vulvar biopsies are taken from multiple different services, including family practitioners, dermatologists, pediatricians, gynecologists, and urologists. And depending on who performed the biopsy, the clinical differential might vary, influencing our ability to make the pathologic diagnosis. Not only are the clinicians a diverse group of people, so are we. Some of us who practice in subspecialty specific services, we know that the vulvar biopsies can end up in any of these different services, depending on who submitted the biopsy, and sometimes even who accessioned the case. And depending on the comfort level of the pathologist with vulvar pathology, there may be some give and take of cases between the different services, as we know. Vulvar pathology can be quite challenging. So if you feel any of these emotions when you encounter vulvar biopsies, just know that you're not alone. My goal today is to offer a practical guide for inflammatory vulvar pathology. The first half of the, half of the talk, I will go through my personal approach to inflammatory vulvar biopsies. And then for the second half of the talk, I will go through some example of commonly encountered entities for inflammatory vulvar path. Here is my personal approach to vulvar biopsies. Basically in any setting, I go through these questions because I know how much clinical overlap there can be between um, vulvar disease entities. The first question is, is there a neoplastic process? VIN, SEC, melanocytic proliferation, and pages being the most common things to look for. Second question is, is there evidence of infection or infestation? Third question, could this be LS? And then lastly, if not, then what is it? And I don't stop at any of these questions, even though the answer might be yes, because there may be more than one process going on in the biopsy. Since vulva is skin, there are many types of rashes that can involve the vulva. And having to consider all of the possibilities could be quite overwhelming. But one thing to remember is that vulva rarely gets biopsied for things that concurrently present at other sites because those other sites are usually the preferred sites of biopsies over vulva. For example, if the patient has psoriasis inv involving uh, many flexural um, points and, and, and then also in the vulva, they would usually go for the arm or the other sites. But um, vulva will be biopsied when the rash appears to present only in the vulva or the vulvar lesion appears distinct enough from the other parts of the rash. So today I'll focus mostly on inflammatory lesions that commonly get biopsied in the vulva. Let's quickly review the vulvar anatomy. Vulva consists of structures within the urogenital triangle and external to the vagina. Anteriorly, the most superficial structure is the mons pubis that blend laterally with labia majora. 
Posteriorly, labia majora merge with the perineal body, which lies between the vagina and the anus. Medial to labia majora are the labia minora, where the skin becomes hairless. Heart's line, here in dotted line, comprises the mucocutaneous junction, a zone of transition between hairless skin and then onto the non-keratinized squamous mucosa. This area medial to the heart's line is the vestibule. Now let's go through these questions to see which features to look for. This first question I will skip as this is not the focus of the talk, but do look for any neoplastic process as it may mimic an inflammatory lesion. Second question is, are there bugs? Is there any evidence for infection or infestation? Infections are quite common in the vulva and often present in the stratum corneum. You will find yeast, pseudohyphae, or true hypoforms indicative of superficial fungal infection, candida, or tinea. Erythrasma caused by chorionic bacteria is also quite common, and you can see numerous thin rods in the um, stratum corneum, even on H&E. I typically order GMS or PAS special stains on any inflammatory biopsies with spongiosis or neutrophils in the stratum corneum, as both fungi and chorionic bacteria can easily be identified through these stains. HSV and BZV can be obvious when cells with nuclear molding, multinucleation, or margination of chromatin are identified, but it can be quite challenging when the lesion is ulcerated and the viral changes are rare. In cases of nonspecific ulcerations, I always check the chart for lesional HSV PCR, and if it was not performed, then I often get IHC, immunohistochemical stains for HSV or BZV. It can be, can be quite challenging and subtle on H&E. EBV can be a clinical mimic of HSV because it often presents as ulcers, and the histopathologic findings can also overlap with HSV. When you have an ulcer from a patient with mononucleosis-like symptoms, or the ulceration is present in a patient without a history of sexual activity, EBV can be suspected and serologies may be recommended. Syphilis is also in the differential for vulvar ulcers. Vulva can be affected by syphilis at all different phases, but um, and while there are characteristic features such as like you know, infiltrates or vacular changes and psoriasis form hyperplasia, the changes can be quite subtle and variable. The most helpful clue is actually the clinical and serologies if, it's avail if they're available. And if not, you know, um, spirocate IHC can be performed if it's an ulceration and you can't find um, any specific diagnosis. Mol molluscum can be the easiest case if you see an intact umbilicated papule with the characteristic viral inclusions like this, but it can be very hard if it's disrupted. So if you have a lesion that looks like a ruptured follicle, um, and think about the possibility of ruptured molluscum and make sure you do level sections to look for viral inclusions. Now onto the third question of, is it like a sclerosis or can it be like a sclerosis? for Caucasian women with two peaks of incidence, one in prepubertal and another in postmenopausal age group. Patients pain, but some can be asymptomatic and may only be detected on clinical exam. LS usually begins uh, around the clitoris, extends into the labia minora and majora, then to the perianal skin. Vaginal involvement is rare. At early stage, there may be erinning, then uh, the patient develop uh, hyperkeratosis and induration. Eventually, patients may develop sclerotic skin with atrophy and hemorrhage. Why is this so important to make a diagnosis of LS? Why do the clinicians always say roll out LS? LS can cause stenosis of the introitus, resulting in impact on quality of life. And not only that, it has been considered to carry an increased risk for the development of different DIN and squamous cell carcinoma. And these complications may be prevented by intervention that begins with our diagnosis of LS. When we see the clinical history of Rolla LS, we all wish for this type of classic well-developed case. We see some suggestion of vacuole change at the basal layer, homogenized dermal collagen, and underlying lichenoid lymphocytic inflammation. So this is classic, but that's not always the case, unfortunately. In early LS, 
microscopic findings may be subtle and thick. Instead of, instead of atrophic epidermis, it may be normal thickness or even acanthotic or thickened. An obvious zone of sclerosis may not be seen. So we need to rely on other clues such as uh, band-like lichenoid lymphocyte predominant inflammation sites in the basal layer of the epidermis. Basement membrane may be thickened in some cases, which would be helpful. For me, the most helpful in the follicular changes when follicles are present. The follicular changes you may see are perifollicular, basement membrane thickening, and fibrosis. Also a key feature to look for is vertical columns of parakeratosis that was described in a subset of non-sclerotic uh, ligand sclerosis. Here is a list of potential changes reported in early LS as summarized in this review article. Epidermis may be thicken, and it may show spongiosis with vacuolar changes. Basement membrane may be normal or thickened. Dermis show interstitial lymphocytic infiltrate. Vessels, vessels may show dilation or hyalinization and even vasculitis. Inflammatory changes may consider exocytosis and acanthosis and hyperkeratosis may be seen in the skin and nexa. In general, I keep a high index, especially if LS is in the clinical differential. And, I, and if I see features that I think could represent early LS, I mention it in the differential diagnosis so it can be followed up appropriately. Since early LS can show nonspecific features, like in planus is differential diagnosis for us. LP is mostly a disease of adult women, and while oral and cutaneous involvement are more common, 20% of patients may present with genital involvement. The typical presentation is introidal erythema plus minus vaginal involvement. That's with LS because LS usually spares the vagina. Wickham striae that is characteristically seen in oral mucosa can also be seen in the vulva. At advanced stage, introidal stenosis and vaginal obliteration can occur similar to LS. The classic features of LP under the scope are hypergranulosis and hyperkeratosis with sawtoothing with pointed reading and lichenoid band-like inflammation that obscures the basal epidermis and it would be lymphocyte predominant and you would see associated necrotic keratinocytes due to this interface activity. Subepidermal clefting, as you can see in the early phase here, may be present. Differentiating LS and LP can be quite challenging due to the overlapping clinical pathologic features, but fortunately there are some helpful clues to tell them apart. The main differentiating features are nicely summarized in Dr. Hong and Salim's Fulver Pathology textbook as seen here. And the clinical clues are at times more helpful than the biopsy itself. So LP is more likely to involve the vagina, oral mucosa, but less frequently involve the perianal region. So dig into the chart to see if there's any suggestion of extra genital skin or mucosal involvement. As for the histopathologic features, the main feature in favor of LP is serrated epidermis, as known as sawtoothing. Basement membrane thickening and homogenous hyalinizations are as clues that actually favor LS, as they are rarely seen in LP. Some of these features may be subtle, so when in doubt, level sections may be helpful. And then when I really struggle to make a definitive diagnosis based on the available information, then I may have to have a descriptive diagnosis mentioning both in the differential and having the clinician correlate clinically. And this may trigger a more extensive clinical exam and follow-up, which may eventually lead to a specific diagnosis for the patient. So don't, if you really don't have enough clinical information and the features are subtle uh, or equivocal on the biopsy, you may um, have a differential diagnosis like here. Another important differential to consider for LS is differentiated BIN. DVIN may co coexist with LS, but should only be diagnosed when there is significant basal atypia. DVIN is a P53 mutation mediated process and is high grade by definition, which and has apparently more rapid progression to SCC when compared to um, high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion that's HPV mediated.
the histologic uh, features of DEVIN are quite challenging to identify because the changes may be subtle and the assessment of these features are quite subjective. The features to look for are elongated reading, atypical basal and parabasal cells characterized by hyperchromatic irregular pleomorphic nuclei with, mag um, with or without macronucleoli. There's often paradoxical maturation with increased proportion of differentiated appearing keratinizing cells and hyper eosinophilic cytoplasm. Not only are the histopathologic findings difficult to interpret, so is the P53 staining pattern. I wish the stain was as clear cut as P16 is for H still, but P53 is not as easy to interpret. This recent paper published by Leo and colleagues characterized the P53 staining pattern seen in Deven. The first pattern seen was null pattern, which is complete or near complete absence of expression. And then a second pattern, which is strong uniform staining in 70% of basal cells or greater and parabasal extension of positivity affecting greater than one third of epithelial thickness. In another report, cytoplasmic positivity has been described as an aberrant staining pattern for P53, cited below number two. Here's an example of a null P53 pattern with complete absence of staining, and then a strong P53 expression pattern with almost all basal cell staining strongly, and, and then over one third of epithelial thickness showing positivity. Parabasal staining and Uniform staining pattern had, had the highest specificity for Deven and uh, Leo study, Leo and Kali study. And uniform staining and staining in over 70% of basal cells had uh, sensitivity over 90%. But there are still enough cases of Deven and inflammatory lesions with overlapping P53 staining pattern. So we have to still rely heavily on histomorphologic features. All right, moving on to the last question of, um, if not LS, then what can it be? Spongiotic dermatitis is a common diagnosis to be considered in inflammatory bulbar lesions. Of various causes that result in spongiosis or intercellular edema, you, that you see manifested by increased white spacing between the keratinocytes, irritant and allergic contact dermatitis is the most common and it represents reaction to chemical, physical, or sensitizing agents. Spongiotic dermatitis has a broad differential that will be discussed in the next slide. At an acute phase, there is a prominent spongiosis with vesicle formation that often contains Langerhans cells and serum. At subacute chronic stage, epidermal thickening is present with hyperkeratosis and often parakeratosis, which means retain nuclei in the stratum corneum. And spongiosis may actually be minimal to absent in subacute chronic sp stage. Dermal inflammation at all stages may contain eosinophils. These are some of the differentials to be considered when you see spongiotic dermatitis and the clues that favor certain etiologies. Here are some of the entities. First of all, one I mentioned um, just now, allergic irritant contact dermatitis, or sometimes eczema, they show similar features of superficial dermal inflammation, often with eosinophils. Fungal infection and erythrasma should always be considered in spongiotic um, dermatitis differential, and GMS and PAS um, should be performed to make sure it's not a fungal or, uh, infection or erythrasma. Insect bite reaction infestation may show deep dermal inflammation containing eosinophils. Drug reaction also can show deep dermal inflammation and additional patterns of interface changes may be present in addition to the spongiosis. Separate dermatitis can involve the vulva and perikeratosis can be seen around the hair follicles with neutrophil and lymphocyte exocytosis, but these are quite nonspecific. Psoriasis is a differential for subacute spongiotic dermatitis. And in this case, uh, neutrophils might be identified in the stratum corneum with regular elongation of reedy ridges, diminished granular layer, prominent keratosis will be present. Early immunobolus disorders such as pemphigus and pemphigoid may present as spongiotic dermatitis, but this often has extra general involvement, so clinical correlation is key. And DIF should be performed when suspected clinically.
In the end, we may only be able to partially narrow down the differential on the biopsy and correlation with clinical findings will be necessary to determine the exact cause. Because many different entities can result in spongiotic dermatitis, these cases often get a descriptive diagnosis with a narrowed down differential based on the clinical features and the presence or absence of the clues. So this is one of the examples, a very common scenario. Psoriasis presents in the vulva as wall demarcated red plaques with thickening and silver scaling. And it is this sharp demarcation that clinically separates this from sp uh, spongiotic dermatitis. When the flexural uh, folds and anogenital region are involved, it is uh, referred to as inverse psoriasis. And under the scope in wall developed lesions, regular acanthosis, so regular elongation of reedy with confluent parakeratosis, so retention of nuclei in the strand corneum, hypogranulosis, so diminished granular layer, and thinning of suprapapillary plate. So epidermis above the um, dermal papillae appear thinned, and then you will see tortuous blood vessels in the dermal papillae. So these are some classic features. Neutrophilic microabscesses can be present and dermal inflammation uh, tends to be lymphocyte predominant. Eosinophils are uncommon, um, and that might be a clue um, in contrast to uh, spongiotic dermatitis, unless there is a history of treated psoriasis or drug-induced psoriasis, and you can see some eosinophils. All right, next I'll go on to, um, to show you some cases on the scope, more, more like on the PowerPoint of captured images. So here is the first case, the most common uh, differential that we get on the clinical history. 53-year-old rollout LS. And when I see this history in my head, I'm imagining the most classic case and just wishing that it would be classic enough that I can diagnose it. Um, so these are, this would be a classic case with some vacuolar suggestion of vacuolar change with um, dermal sclerosis in the superficial, superficial dermis and lichenoid infiltrate and there is some hyperkeratosis in this case. So if you have this kind of picture, then you can conclude that this is LS and it supports their clinical. But unfortunately, not all cases are like that, and this is what the actual case looks like. So here we have a uh, punch biopsy, so what looks like a punch biopsy, um, with thickened stratum corneum, um, tangentially suction epidermis, and some suggestion of fibrosis, but it's not really sclerotic. And then in the next cell, we see some perianexal inflammation and maybe some suggestion of fibrosis. So we'll go higher power. And before we address the question of rollout LS, um, let's just go through the questions first. So the first question that I mentioned is, is there any neoplastic process? And at this low power, I don't see an indication of a neoplastic process. And even at low power, you, know, you may see some atypia. And in this case, I don't quite see any atypia at the basal layer to suggest even, but we will look at that closely. Second question of, is there an infectious process? And when it's not obvious on um, low power, always stare at the stratum cornea to see if you see any clues. And in this case, um, I see some thread-like rods here going across the stratum, layers of stratum cornea. And when I see this, I know that this represents erythrasma. Uh, for confirmation, GMS was done and the organism is highlighted by uh, the GMS stain. And the more you look at a positive fungal um, cases against erythrasma, you would be you should be able to differentiate the morphology based on the thickness and appearance. And this in this case is consistent with erythrasma. So going back to the low power again. So going even deeper than where we were seeing um, the anexal structures, I see a follicle anexal structure that has perifollicular fibrosis. So that's a clue, and that's the clue that uh, I might be dealing with LS as a clinician suspected. So when I have these equivocal features and suggestion of LS, and especially in a poorly oriented uh, specimen, I would always get deeper levels because the answer might be hiding deeper in the block. And this is what I get on the deeper section, a completely di different picture. So we have the same uh, follicle here, and there is definitely a pronounced fibrosis. But what is strikingly different from the initial level is the amount of sclerosis that you see on this um, level. And then the small fragment that was there on the side has even more pronounced uh, fibrosis or sclerosis. And then there is band-like 
lymphocytic uh, lycanoid infiltrate. On a higher power, you confirm that there is sclerosis in the um, dermal stroma, and you see perianexal inflammation. Just highlighting the follicular changes. Once again, in this case, we see perifollicular fibrosis, perifollicular inflammation, and then um, a feature that I mentioned at 4 um, LS, which is hyperkeratosis of the follicle. And here is the opening of the follicle, and you see compact hyperkeratosis. And here is an image of another case for a um, relatively normal follicle with you know, flaky um, keratin, unlike the keratin in the LS case that's very compact and hyperkeratotic. So this case was example of lichen sclerosis plus erythrasma. So just remember that you may see more than one process going on in vulvar biopsies. So go through all of the questions in um, your mind to make sure you don't miss anything. Case number two is 51-year-old lacy patches along the buccal mucosa and vulvar lesion. So when I get this history, I immediately know that this is probably a dermatologist or um, generalist who looks at the patient from head to toe. So this um, clinical history is very helpful, and we can kind of get the clue that the, patient, uh, the clinician is thinking about possibly LP based on these lacy patches. And under the scope, this is what we see. We had a shade biopsy with hypergranulosis, hyperkeratosis, pointer VD ridges um, with effacement of the basal layer by lymphocytic inflammation, and these eosinophilic globules, which represent necrotic keratinocytes. So this is, um, with that clinical history, um, you know, features that really favor LP. So in this case, it's quite diagnostic of LP, and that's what the clinician thought. So it confirmed the clinical suspicion. Next case, um, a 54-year-old woman, roll out SEC. I included this case to demonstrate some of the things I mentioned about Devin. So here is the, um, the specimen that shows invasive carcinoma on one side, and then area of without invasive carcinoma on the other. And even on low power, we see that the basal and parabasal cells appear quite basophilic. So you're thinking that this could represent Devin. And unlike um, HSO that has full thickness uh, involvement by basal appearing cells at low power. Here we see um, atypical basal cells in the bottom, but then re really hyper eosinophilic epidermis for the rest. So let's see on low, um, higher power what that looks like. This is an appearance of uh, high power, and we, uh, we can confirm that there is um, increased um, Oh, involvement of the basal layer and parabasal layers by these atypical keratinocytes characteristic of differentiated BIN. And these cells have um, hyperchromatic nuclei with nuclear polymorphism, which means difference in size and shape of the nuclei. And um, this involves the basal and parabasal layers. On the left side, the epidermis is not as atypical, and I would say it's not definitively deepen, and it's closer to um, adjacent uninvolved skin, skin not involved by Deven. And um, if you compare that area to the right side, which is involved by Deven, you see the features of paradoxical maturation with um, cells in, above the parabasal layers showing increased cytoplasm and hyper eosinophilia. It's quite more eosinophilic compared to the adjacent skin. And also you have the characteristic um, parakeratosis that we often see. P53 was performed, and this um, represents the same field as the previous slide. And what you see here is that you know, P53 does appear to be somewhat increased compared to the adjacent, but it does not meet the criteria of uniform basal strong staining. Here we have patchy staining in cells that we, uh, we can tell are atypical. And then the positivity doesn't extend very far above the um, parabasal layer. So it, it's less than one third from what I can see. So just remember that in, a case, in cases that are clear cut even on H&E, we may not have a supporting P53 staining pattern. And in these cases, we have to go back to the morphology and make the diagnosis. And then in case this was a case of Deven plus SEC. Next case is a 70, 70 year old woman. 
prior history of HSIL, none of which was reviewed at our institution. And this was a first specimen at our institution. And this is what we see. Unlike the prior case with you know, prominent um, atypia limited to basal parabasal layers, here we have atypical cells almost replacing the entire thickness of the epidermis. What's a little odd is the presence of these um, hyper eosinophilic cells in the superficial epidermis. And also we see a really prominent sclerosis and uh, like, you know, lymphocytic inflammation, which is not that specific in the setting of uh, dysplasia and neoplasty process, but this was also present in areas that um, to me didn't look dysplastic in another part of the slide. So I decided, you know, this, this is the first specimen at UCLA, we better make sure this is truly H cell, even though it had morphologic features that really favor H cell. P16 was performed and it's negative, um, negative result. There's some weak expression in some of the cells, but it's definitely not the uh, block positivity that you would expect in H cell for P16. So then the next question is, could this be Deven? And this is a P53 stain, which shows almost all, um, all basal cells sh showing positivity for P53 with extension of positivity well over one third of the epidermis. And this case was actually a Deven mimicking H cell. So remember that, you know, usually morphology is very clear cut and differentiating between H cell and Deven. And many times, you know, we may be tempted to just diagnose H cell on, on H and E. Um, I think on the, for, for the at least the first biopsy of H cell, it would be, um, it would be important to confirm the diagnosis with P16. And if it's negative, then I'll move on to P53 to um, explore the possibility of Deven. Okay, on to the fourth case, 37 year old women vulvar irritation in the right vulva and leukoplakia, labia magus biopsy. This is what we see under the scope. So we see markedly thickened epidermis here. So acanthotic epidermis. And even at this power, we see that you know, the white spaces between the keratinocytes, which is indicative of spongiosis. So to me, on low power, this looks like subacute chronic spongiotic dermatitis. Uh, just checking out the dermal inflammation to see what, what cells are in there. I see there are numerous eosinophils. So that kind of supports my um, low power impression. Looking at the epidermis closely again, we see the white spaces um, consistent with spongiosis. And what else we see? We see hypergranulosis and hyperkeratosis, and also some vertical columns of um, fibrosis in the dermal papillae. So in addition to subacute chronic spongiotic dermatitis, you know, I make a diagnosis of lichen spindlex chronicus, which is a nonspecific pattern induced by chronic irritation and excoriation. And this may um, be observed clinically as um, leukoplakia as a clinician in, uh, indicated in the clinical history. There um, is um, characterized by hyperkeratosis and then hypergranulosis and acanthosis, vertical fibrosis of papillary dermis. And then when you see these patterns, um, we should usually, uh, when you see patterns that are consistent with uh, LSC, then you would want to look for possible primary cause of why the patient is irritated. So in this case, I make a diagnosis of subacute chronic spongiotic dermatitis with like a simplex chronicus. Here's a different patient uh, with a similar a clinical history of irritation. And we see kind of the similar features of spongiosis with acanthosis. There is a parakeratosis, but at this power, I don't see any neutrophils. So this is in the differential for spongiotic dermatitis. And as I uh, mentioned earlier, in all of these cases, I throw on a GMS or PAS. And what did this show? So here we see on PAS D stain, um, ease, and pseudohypoforms. So this one is actually a candida. So the diagnosis would be superficial fungal infection consistent with candida. And last set of cases that I have here, I have as cl uh, clinical mimics of condylomas. So this is a 48 year old woman with newly found raised area in the vulva rollout wart. 
because the clinicians are very <clears throat> used to the um, you know, diagnosis of wart, then um, a lot of the polypoid appearing lesions come with that differential. But uh, under the site, it, they may end up being a very a diverse group of uh, diseases that mimic warts. Okay, here is a somewhat polypoid skin fragment that came in with rollout wart. And what do I see here? There is prominent dermal um, inflammation. So you know that this could be possibly a rupture follicle or folliculitis. So going at a higher power than inflammation, we see that the inflammation is more like an abscess with uh, neutrophil predominant inflammation. So still could be inflamed follicle or rupture follicle of folliculitis. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, in these cases, when there is a big gap in the tissue like this, and when there are features that you know, look like folliculitis, I do more levels to see if there's anything I'm missing here. And on deeper levels, more epithelium showed up in the um, area of inflammation. So is this a rupture follicle? And some of you may have noticed already that something looks odd here. Something looks out of place. And what you discover on deeper section is that this is actually a molluscum. So um, just a demonstration of a case that is a sneaky molluscum and just a reminder that you know, level sections can really um, help you answer the question of what this is. This is another rollout work case and this was sampled um, from the labia minora slash vestibule. And what do you see here? We see a polypoid um, projection of the um, mucosa, squamous mucosa, with glycogenated cells. What I don't see here for wart are the viral cytopathic changes. I don't see enlarged nuclei, hyperchromatic nuclei, or anything like that. So I don't have any morphologic evidence, despite the polypoid architecture, to support wart as a diagnosis. So what could this uh, uh, represent? So in this case, I did do, um, we do have access to HPV-ish, and because clinically they were very concerned about a ward, and often the clinicians request this ish, um, I performed it and it was confirmed to be negative. And what it ended up being on clinical um, description and um, histopathologic findings is that this likely represents vestibular papillomatosis. Vestibular papillomatosis is likely a normal anatomic variation of the vulva that present as one to three millimeter asymmetrically distributed papules. On microscopic exam, as we see, saw in the case, uh, the lesions consist of polypoid squamous mucosa with no HPV viral cytopathic effect. So let's just keep in mind um, that this is in, in the differential for vestibular lesion. Okay, so a third case of rollout wart is a patient who is 35 years old noticed a painless, itchy labial lesion that grew rapidly over a two week period. The gynecologist noted an irregularly shaped one by two centimeter mass at the end of labia majora. And she says rollout wart. And on low power, we see um, area of acanthosis with spongiosis. So this area looks like it could be spongiotic dermatitis. But what's obvious here is the presence of ulceration. So when you see ulceration, your differential bro uh, diagnosis broadens to think about um, you know, HSV or other viral cytopathic um, process or other infectious inf or infestation as a possibility. And some of you may have noticed um, already in this low power, but not having used to seeing these cases, you know, I have to go to high power to see what they actually are. So here, you know, you see that there's something that's, you know, doesn't belong here. So here are the ova of parasites. And some of you might be very used to this morphology, but um, we here don't see this very commonly. So we got, uh, a clinical microbiologist took a look, and it was determined that the features are consistent with schistosomiasis. And um, on clinical inquiry after this diagnosis, it was noted that patient previously uh, resided in Malawi for six years for her work, during which she had multiple exposures to fresh water in Lake Malawi. So that fit with the clinical diagnosis of schistosomiasis. Okay, fourth case of rollout ward. Um, and you, you already know that this is a very diverse group of cases. Now we're moving on to another case that's very interesting. 
So here we have acanthosis of the epithelium. And you can see why they may have thought this was a wart. It's very verrucous and polypoid appearing. Another thing that looks mis uh, misplaced here on low power is this gland. It does, just doesn't look like a part of normal skin. On higher power, we see that this, is, uh, this appears to be colonic. And on deeper sections that was done for the IAC, you see that you know, this have architecture of clotted glands, intestinal glands, and it is CK20 diffusely positive, CK7 vocally weakly positive. Since we are in the gyne world, we have to um, make sure that this is, um, this is not um, H HPV driven or metastatic endocervical adenocarcinoma. So P16 was done and um, also chromogranin was done to see if there were any um, endocrine elements. So here is a P16 stain and it was confirmed to be patchy weak positive. So this confirms that this is not endocervical. And then um, what's interesting is that we have you know, positive staining in the endocrine cells of the gland. So these are co considered to be intestinal glands and consistent with cloacogenic remnants. Cloacogenic remnants are thought to be congenital rests of intestinal epithelium that were left behind during division of urogenital tract and rectum. So, and it's characterized by columnar cells with admixed goblet cells and endocrine cells and that can be highlighted by neuroendocrine markers. And these glands tend to be in direct continuity with the superficial um, squamous mucosa, which is, was the case in this case. Here are some take home points for the talk today. So first of all, clinical correlation is for, very important for um, skin, you know, skin rashes. So dig into the chart and lab values to see if you have any clues that were not given to you in the clinical history. Run through the questions of all the various possibilities of um, inflammatory bulbar pathology biopsies. And for me, those questions are, is it neoplastic? Is it infectious or infestation? Um, can it be LS? And if not, then what? If you can't get to a specific diagnosis, then it's okay to have a differential diagnosis and have the clinician follow the patient and get, obtain more clinical history and follow up. Early LS can have non-specific findings, so we need to look for um, the clues such as thick and basement membrane or anexal follicular changes. When findings are equivocal for any vulvar inflammatory case, get level sections as the answer might be just waiting for you deeper in the block. So I want to thank you everyone for joining and um, thank you for your attention. And I want to give thanks to the faculty and trainees at UCLA Pathology who continuously share cases with me and teach, teach me something new. And I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. And please feel thank free to so, email me. Thank you so much, Dr. Kang, for this excellent discussion on inflammatory valvular pathology. So, here is one question I see online. So the question is, uh, I will read it. So I get vulvar biopsies to rule out lichen sclerosis. Mm -hmm. However, the biopsy is essentially normal. And when I check clinical findings, it is more of a situation of pain or discomfort. Is there something helpful that I can do in this setting? Yeah, so there are many um, cases of vulvar pain or, you know, vulvodynia, vestibulodynia, that we can't really have a, um, come up with a definitive diagnosis. So first of all, um, they, you know, most clinicians like, yeah, like the um, question was referring to, have, wants to build up LS. So that's one thing that could be really helpful for them. So if you see normal skin and you do deeper levels and still looks normal, that's actually a pretty significant finding, even though it's a negative finding. So I would mention that, um, that you don't have definitive features of LS. If you do see some changes such as spongiosis, some lymphocyte exocytosis, and you think, okay, it doesn't look classic for LS, but I can't completely exclude early LS, that's one thing to mention, so that at least the patient gets followed up appropriately to see uh, um, if they eventually develop more classic features of LS. So that's one thing. And then the second thing of 
Is there anything else to mention? Um, if you have diagnostic features of other entities such as, you know, spongiotic dermatitis, uh, that could be allergic or irritant contact, that can sometimes um, present with pain. So that's one thing to look for. And if you're really struggling and there, it look, really looks normal on many sections, then it might be just, um, it might be a diagnosis of bulbodynia or, or vestibulodynia. And some of the features that were described in those entities are, um, hyperplasia of the nerves. That's one thing that was described, but it's quite subjective and very difficult to be sure, definitive about if you're not used to seeing, you know, multiple vulvar biases to know whether, you know, it's, it looks like increased nerves or not. But that's one of the things that was described is increase in nerves. And then in vestibulodynia, sometimes they uh, mention inf inflammation in the, in the glands. So that might be a feature to mention, but those are all non-specific features and they're um, hardly definitive, but that those are the features that were, have been described in those cases of the vulvodynia or vestibulodynia. All right, uh, thank you. So there is another question. So this is about uh, B53. So uh, do you think that you use B53 to differentiate from uh, neoplastic lesions in the vulva? So the only setting I really do P53 is if I'm worried about even, and um, you know inflammatory lesions are found have been found to have some overlapping P53 patterns. So um, you know that has to be taken with caution. But in terms of other neoplastic process, um, I don't. Um, so far, you know, in terms of epithelial process, that's the only setting that I use it for, and I use it with caution. You know, knowing. Uh, that you know, I would only do it on cases I would call on H and E. So P fifty three, I do just to support, and rarely on normal looking biopsies or inf inflammatory looking biopsies. So those oh, are all very good questions. Thank you so much. Right. And, and here is another question that, that uh, know, if you have a warty lesion, so how often, you know, like. Um, uh, how often is condyloma a differential diagnosis and how do you differentiate from a condyloma with low-grade dysplasia? Oh, so condyloma and um, low-grade dysplasia are synonymous and per the uh, last um, criteria that was published with this, which is a consensus paper with including derma, dermatologists, dermatopathologists, gyne, gyne pathologists, um, you know, low-grade squamous intraepithelial the lesions are used synonymously with condyloma acuminatum. So um, often, you know, I do tailor the phrasing of um, the, uh, the diagnosis based on who the clinician is, if I happen to know. And dermatologists are more used to condyloma terminology. So I might put condyloma in parentheses um, and then in parentheses, ELSO, so low grade square with intrapathelial lesion, whereas gynecologists are more um, used to ELSO terminology. So that's what I would use in low grade square with intrapathelial lesion, um, VIM1. So it's a terminology issue, not really, um, there aren't really um, features to differentiate between condyloma versus ELSO, they're synonymous. Right. So no, I think the question was about how do you differentiate from low grade from a warty lesion when you are doubtful? Oh, you mean like a non HPV warty lesion, warty appearance? Right, right, right. right. Yeah. So um, I do look for the cytologic features. So I do look for um, increase um, increased nuclear size, hyperchromatic nuclei, you know, irregular nuclear contour, and then um, it's kind of similar to how I would look for um, also on on cervical biopsy. So I use the same cytologic features to look for that, and then if um, if the clinical suspicion is very high um, and, and they're worried about it, we have access to ish here. So that's what I might use. If I don't have cytologic features and ish is negative, then I say I don't have feature the diagnostic for um, low grade or a condyloma. So that's how I usually approach it. If I have classic morphologic features, then I might I would usually not do ish because it can be negative as ish is o includes only a subset of HPV and not all HPVs. So I don't want to have a confusing picture. So I often, if I have classic um, uh, low grade or uh, condylomatous cytologic um, features, then I would usually go by morphology. And sometimes so here, the history of HPV is also helpful if the patient has a known HPV disease. That might be another reason to kind of um, explore further the, the possibility of HPV wart. 
and then do level sections or do ish even um, if you don't have like classic features. That might be a setting where I might do an ish despite nor, um, non classic wordy region. I guess so. I think so. Uh, <laughs> here is another question. I think this is similar, but uh, the question is what's the difference between VI and, and ACIL? I think you addressed that. Maybe yeah, you want yeah. to go. Yeah, so again. this is all, all terminology issue. And um, so VIN stands for vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia, which includes low grade and high grade. And so VIN includes, um, so VIN1 would be equivalent to low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. And then VIN two or three would include um, high grade squamous intrapathelial lesions. So it's all um, terminology issue. And for high grade lesions, so uh, when you have high grade uh, squamous intrapathelial lesion, do you still comment VIN in parentheses or you don't? Yeah, so it's, it's optional, but um, since the clinicians are used to seeing it, I usually include it, especially for gyne gyne uh, gynecologists gynecologists. They're used to the VIN terminology. So I would include um, HSOL and then parentheses VIN 2-3. I think the next question is that how often do you find P16 and uh, KI67 helpful in uh, a VIN setting? Yeah, so um, between uh, low grade and high grade, it's very helpful in the vulva. Um, so P16 tends to be very reliable. Um, and that said, if the morphology is classic, and if you're debating between low grade and high grade, morphology is classic for low grade, I usually um, don't use P16. And, and then um, if it's high grade, um, for the reason that I mentioned earlier is that you want to confirm it's um, P16 positive. So I do do a P16 at, at least on the first diagnosis. So in that way, uh, the vulva it tends to be quite reliable. And then um, in terms of KI-67, I have seen them used a lot. And um, so increased KI-67 staining you know, above, the, above the basal layer um, and throughout the epidermis, it, it's, um, it's, it's helpful, but, it, and it, but it's both seen in low grade and high grade. So I would uh, typically not use it to differentiate between the two. And I personally, I don't, I'm not used to using it very much. And I go by more of a cytomorphology to differentiate between L-cell and high grade. Uh, there is another question. I'm not sure if I can understand it well. Okay. It's about, is it necessary in remnant glucosinic to use immunohistochemistry? Um, it's not critical. Um, it was, um, in this case, more of an academic uh, for reason that I did a lot of those things. But it's, um, if it looks benign and it looks intestinal, um, you can describe it as benign intestinal glands and it may represent cloacogenic remnants. That said, the other possibility that has been um, brought up for these intestinal type glands in the vulva or vagina or that they're metaplastic process. So you may want to mention that in the um, comment, but these are all academic questions. And you know, in, in, in all honesty, it's, uh, you know, if it looks benign, it's benign and you can uh, describe it. Um, the only, only reason I would do um, stain, um, as I mentioned earlier, is that in rare cases, you can have uh, metastatic um, the endocervical adenocarcinoma um, that has intestinal morphology. And in this case on h &E, it was such a small focus that I, I didn't feel comfortable relying um, on histomorphology alone. And that was the reason I did P16 to make sure it was not, um, block po not positive. But that would be the only reason to do um, IHC in my opinion, because if it is metastatic, you know, colonic adenocarcinoma, it should be more obvious on h &E that is malignant. Right. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Kang. I think these are the questions that uh, I could find online. And if you have more questions, you can send them to us and you can also uh, send the questions to Dr. Kang and uh, she would be more than happy to answer them. And if you send it to us, we will pass them over to you, Dr. Kang. So she would be uh, happy to answer them later as well. And uh, Dr. Kang, you would be really happy to hear that you had uh, several hundred viewers from across the world. And I could see viewers as far away from Colombia um, and Finland, India, Sri Lanka, just to name a few. And uh, thanks to our viewers for watching.
and if you like our lectures please don't forget to subscribe to our youtube channel that is patkas and also like and follow the facebook page and we have the website that is a pathologicast.com and if you um access the lecture you can have all the gy and pathology lectures that are that you can find arranged by subspeciality and our next lecture is coming up so that is on november 24th and it would be a lecture on cytopathology and dr michelle reed from emory university hospital will be presenting on cytopathology of solid pancreatic neoplasms that would be at 8 a.m. Eastern time. Hope uh, to see you at that time. And thank you again, Dr. Kang, for joining us today. We appreciate it a lot. Thank you very much, Dr. Manon. Thank you.